FTC, CFTC. Okay, Gus, uh, you guys ready to pick up now? On and set. Hey, copy that. It is on and center. Hey, how are we going to get the moon if we can't talk between three buildings? I can't hear a thing you're saying. The name Apollo 1 evokes both triumph and tragedy, a moment when humanity's boldest dream of reaching the moon collided with the deadly realities of early spaceflight. It was supposed to be America's next great leap, the first crewed mission of the Apollo program, paving the way to Neil Armstrong's giant step just two years later. But on the evening of January 27, 1967, three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, lost their lives in a flash fire inside their spacecraft during a routine ground test. For decades, the details of what really caused the inferno remained buried under official reports, bureaucratic phrasing, and the fog of technical jargon. Now, with NASA finally acknowledging in full the chain of human errors, engineering flaws, and design decisions that led to the Apollo 1 fire, the story stands as both an admission and a lesson. This is what NASA finally admits caused the Apollo 1 tragedy. A perfect storm of pressure and oxygen. 31 on January 27th, launch controllers heard Chaffee exclaim, hey... Ten seconds later, White would call, I've got a fire in the cockpit. In just 15 seconds, the fire got so big, the capsule cracked from the pressure. Controllers heard, I'm burning up, and then a scream. They found Grissom on the floor of the capsule. White was found reaching for the handle to open the hatch. He couldn't open it because there was too much pressure on the inside. When Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee suited up for their pre-flight plugs-out test at Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 34, no one thought danger lurked inside the capsule. The test was considered low risk because the rocket was unfueled, yet the conditions inside the command module were anything but safe. NASA engineers had filled the cabin with pure oxygen pressurized to 16.7 psi, two pounds higher than normal atmospheric pressure. That environment, as later revealed, created an invisible tinderbox. Materials that were normally non-flammable in mixed air became explosively combustible in pure oxygen. Even a spark, an unseen electrical arc, could turn fabric, insulation, and wiring into fuel. The Apollo 204 Review Board, assembled the day after the fire, determined that the ignition source likely came from frayed wiring near the environmental control system under Gus Grissom's seat. Although the exact wire that sparked could never be identified, the investigators found evidence of multiple short circuits. The cabin, filled with pressurized oxygen, allowed the frame to race unchecked through every flammable surface. Nylon netting, Velcro, and even the astronauts' suits burned in seconds. Temperatures rose so rapidly that the pressure vessel ruptured in under 30 seconds, flooding the launch structure with smoke and flames. NASA later admitted that this decision to conduct a test in pure oxygen under pressure was a grave misjudgment. The risk had been raised in internal memos before the accident, but was dismissed as acceptable. Engineers had used similar atmospheres in Mercury and Gemini capsules, yet the difference was critical. Those earlier spacecraft had smaller interiors and less combustible materials. In Apollo 1, everything from the seat fabric to the wiring insulation became a potential wick. That decision proved fatal. The crew's final moments. The data logs from that night read like a countdown to catastrophe. At 6.31.04 p.m., a sudden transmission crackled over the intercom. Fire in the cockpit. It was Roger Chafee's voice. Calm, but urgent. Within seconds, pressure sensors registered a violent spike as heat expanded the cabin air. The astronauts tried to open the inner hatch, but it was designed to open inward and sealed tighter as internal pressure mounted. Ed White, positioned in the center seat, reached for the release handle. Post-accident examination found his harness still buckled and the handle partially moved, proof that he tried to follow procedure. Outside the capsule, pad technicians heard screams and saw flames behind the small window. They raced to open the three-layer hatch, 
but the process was slow even under perfect conditions. The outer and middle hatches had to be pried open manually, while smoke choked the worker's visibility. By the time the final latch gave way, the cabin was a blackened furnace. In the five minutes between the first cry and the opening of the hatch, the men inside had already succumbed to toxic fumes. NASA's medical reports later confirmed that the astronauts did not die from burns, but from asphyxiation caused by carbon monoxide and other combustion gases. The intense fire consumed oxygen faster than it could be vented, creating a deadly mixture that overwhelmed their lungs. It was a horrifying irony. The same pure oxygen meant to sustain them had turned into their killer. The Fallout. Grief, Anger, and Accountability. We, we found that there had been a very uh, slipshod workmanship at North American on the, on the spacecraft. The test itself had never been categorized as uh, dangerous. Any object in, in that concentration of pure oxygen, uh, it, it ex almost explodes. We had overlooked that. The shock was immediate and profound. President Lyndon B. Johnson called the deaths a great loss to our nation, while Vice President Hubert Humphrey promised their sacrifice would not halt the race to the moon. Around the world, sympathy poured in. Even Radio Moscow broadcast condolences praising the bravery of America's astronauts. But inside NASA, grief soon gave way to self-reckoning. The agency's leadership faced congressional hearings that pulled no punches. The Apollo 204 Review Board's 3,000-page report laid bare the system's failures. It cited poor communication between NASA and North America American Aviation, the contractor responsible for the spacecraft, as a major factor. Electrical wiring had been sloppily bundled, flammable materials lined the cabin walls, and the hatch system was a death trap in any emergency. Perhaps most damning was the revelation that NASA had classified the ground test as non-hazardous, meaning no emergency crews or firefighting systems had been positioned nearby. There were no breathing masks ready for rescuers and no plan for extracting astronauts from a burning spacecraft. NASA Administrator James E. Webb told Congress, quote, Although everyone realized that someday space pilots would die, who would have thought the first tragedy would be on the ground? It was a grim acknowledgement of misplaced priorities. Space travel had seemed most dangerous in flight, yet the deadliest moment so far had occurred during a simple rehearsal. Technical Overhaul NASA Rebuilds Apollo when the tragedy struck, one of the astronauts shouted, fire in the spacecraft. In a few seconds, all three were victims of the swift inferno which left the capsule a blackened shell. One reporter said it looked like the inside of a furnace. Investigators theorized that perhaps a short circuit or electrical overload may have sparked the blaze. In the aftermath, NASA halted all crewed missions and undertook a sweeping redesign of the Apollo spacecraft. The most critical change was the hatch. The old inward-opening three-piece system was scrapped in favor of a single outward-opening hatch that could be released in three seconds. New rules banned the use of pure oxygen at high pressure during ground tests, replacing it with a safer nitrogen-oxygen mix. Every material inside the capsule was re-evaluated for flammability, and thousands of feet of electrical wiring were rerouted and shielded. Astronaut Frank Borman, one of the review board members, later told Congress that he personally tested the redesigned systems and found the changes profound and reassuring. New fireproof suits replaced the old nylon versions. A new culture of safety oversight took root. The Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance Office was created, reporting directly to the Johnson Space Center director. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, formed in the wake of Apollo 1, still operates today, a living legacy of the crew's sacrifice. These reforms delayed the Apollo program by 21 months, but they made the difference between disaster and triumph. When Apollo 7 launched in October 1968, carrying astronauts Wally Shira, Don Eisel, and Walt Cunningham, the mission went off flawlessly. It was the first manned test of the redesigned spacecraft, the one that finally worked. In a sense, Grissom, White, and Chafee flew again through their successors. The Long Shadow of Apollo 1 On January 27, 1967, my little eight-year-old world was torn apart. On that evening, my mother had to tell my brother, Stephen, and me that our daddy was never coming home. For years, the fire remained a painful memory that NASA avoided discussing in public. The agency's early statements had been careful, technical, and at times evasive. It wasn't until later anniversaries that NASA officials began speaking more candidly about what went wrong. By 2022, on the 55th anniversary, the agency fully acknowledged that the Apollo 1 tragedy resulted not from a single malfunction, but from a chain of preventable conditions. 
missions. John Uri of NASA's Johnson Space Center summarized it best. Both technical and management lapses led to the accident. It was an admission that decades earlier might have saved reputations, but its power lies in its honesty. The Apollo 1 fire forced NASA to confront its own culture, the tendency to prioritize schedule over safety, confidence over caution. That reckoning reshaped the agency's approach to risk, influencing everything from shuttle design to modern spacecraft development. Now it's time to hear from you. Which part of the story was most surprising? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below.